Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, former NFL quarterback Gus Farratt, and welcome to the new 1631 Digital News Studio. You know, some people say, no news is good news. Well, I say to those people, you've never read 1631digitalnews.com. Go to 1631digitalnews.com to get your latest news, sports, music, and entertainment. And maybe even listen to your favorite podcast, Huddle Up with Gus. Check it out today at www.1631digitalnews.com. Huddle Up with Gus is brought to you by Vegas Sports Advantage. Clients of Vegas Sports Advantage are winning big in 2021, and you can be a part of the winning too. As of June 1st, $100 bettors are up $3,700. $500 bettors are up $18,500. And $1,000 bettors are up $37,000. And $5,000 bettors are up $185,000. Become a client today by clicking the link in the description below. And use promo code HUDDLEUP to take 25% off your package today. Thanks to our partnership. Welcome to what surely will be a doozy of a matchup right here, sports fans. Whether your game is on the gridiron, at the diamond, or on the links, we can only say... Welcome to this week's Huddle Up with Gus. 15-year NFL quarterback Gus Barat's passion for sports has taken him on the field and behind the benches, playing for seven NFL franchises with 114 TDs under his belt. Gus knows who the players are and how the games are won. Oh, it's not every day you get to hang out with an NFL quarterback, huh? Okay, sports fans, from the decked out and plush 1631 Digital Studios, it's kickoff time. So snap your chin straps on and Get ready to huddle up with Gus. Strange variety, but again, a big play to Leslie. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, Gus Farratt. Uh, good to be back with you, 15-year NFL quarterback. Um, I want to thank today all of our partners and sponsors, uh, 1631 Digital News. I appreciate them always helping us and sharing um, all of our episodes. Uh, Sounder FM. Uh, who we sh- use our for our podcast uh, platform. They are great people. And I want to thank Super Dot Events for hosting us here today for this new uh, live program, which is cool, which all of our fans can interact with us. They can come on stage with us. They can take a selfie. Uh, it's just so much fun. And um, I want to thank my team, Terry, and my boys, Gunnar and Gabe, are in the background. They're doing all the moderating today. So thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Um, today, our guest, uh, you may know him from a previous ep- episode, Matthew Lawrence. Uh, we don't need to go into his background because we got into all that, but he does have a twin and he is from Long Island. So that's about all we need to know about that. That's it. That's yeah, all. that's it. And then our new guest today, this is our first time having two guests on one show, uh, John wow. Ashton. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited. You know, he's been in, uh, he's a very famous actor. He's been in a ton of movies. Uh, you, you may know him from Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Midnight Run. Tons of other things. I my favorite picture of you, John, was when you were in Mash. Um, I used to watch that show all the time. But uh, John Ashton, uh, welcome to the show, and I appreciate you uh, joining us today. and And I can't thank you enough for Matthew for bringing on one of your good friends. Yeah, uh, I'll just get this out of the way right away, okay? okay. And then I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said this to him, so. I'm going to mute his face so I'm not looking at him. (laughs) John Ashton, uh, for all his flaws, and there are many, trust me, (laughs) John Ashton is, you remember how I get choked up? I do. Yeah, I do. John Ashton is a legend in our business. And he will never say this. Shut up, John. Uh, To other actors, (laughs) to other actors, one of the truly great actors in our profession, of our generation, of any generation. Um, And I don't usually go a little nuts when I meet people, you know, because I... I'm a famous celebrity myself, so that stuff doesn't Uh, get... You saw you had star by your name when you came in. Yeah, that's true. Um, but the first time I met John and I, to be honest, I don't really remember when that was. Maybe John knows. Um, 
I was a little uh, fanboyish, I think, even if I didn't act it, because of the respect and admiration I have for him as an actor. Now, once I got to know him as a person, that all changed. But the <laughs> acting part of it was uh, pretty special to me. So it's it's an honor for me, John, to be on any platform with you since I never got to act with you, which is just a travesty of a mockery of a sham. But I wanted to get that out of the way. And now you guys go. Go. <laughs> well, so what do you think that, John? Well, Matthew, thank you very much, and good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Show's over. <laughs> Show's over. Great. Show's thank over. you very much. We're good. Yeah, we'll see you. Um, no, that was great. Thank you, Matthew. It is, it, you know, it is wonderful when you get to meet the people that have come kind of before you or in that peer group that you're in. Like, that's how I felt when I met Terry Bradshaw, because that was always my idol growing up here in Pittsburgh and watching him play. And that's why I had the number 12. So, John, what do you think about how does that make you feel? when Matthew talks about you like that. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm speechless, but uh, that that was fantastic, Matthew. Thank you. And, you know, I respect you as an actor, too. I mean, you've done some wonderful things, you know, and uh, um, I, I think the first time we met was playing golf out at Los Robles in Thousand Oaks, I think, was the oh. when we when we used to have the Thursday group, the Thursday themes, yeah, I think. That's I think, right. I think that's where we met. And uh, I've always respected you as an actor and thought you were terrific. And I think you should still be doing it. And I keep bugging you about it. But uh, anyway, um, I don't know what to say. Thank you, man. Uh, I never I never I never knew you felt that way. But now that I know that I'm never talking to you again. Yeah. <laughs> so John, what do you think is what do you think's better? Uh Matthew's acting or Matthew's golf game? Because I've been trying to figure this out since we've met. Well, you know, acting and golf are a lot alike, you know. I mean, so you got your good days and you got your bad days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they, sometimes yeah. they use sometimes they use that take you wish you hadn't they, they used, you know, and sometimes yeah, you yeah. could take and sometimes you could take that putt back too, you know. So yeah, you know, they're they're kind of similar. I the, the one thing and we were talking about this, the, the one thing about our profession as actors and, and being golfers, we have probably seen and done more things in the world than I would have ever, ever been able to do had I not been an actor or a golfer. I, yeah. I like uh, meeting Matthew. I mean, you just go out on a golf course, you meet these people, you become friends. I mean, Jim McMahon and I are great friends and we met during a golf tournament, you know, and we've been friends for 20 years now. And, I'm going to see him actually in the two weeks down in Florida. But uh, uh, it's just, it's amazing how our profession and the game of golf has been able, enabled me to see the world that I, that I would have never seen had I not chosen the craft that I chose. Yeah. I also think that, you know, us, us as players can't do what you guys do. And yeah, maybe you guys can come and do what we do, but you really don't want to. It's like being in a car wreck all the time. And golf, <laughs> is, a good, golf is a good mediator for us to go out, have fun, you know, not play a sport that's crazy physical, but you can have a lot of fun doing it. And it is a great way to meet people. And, well, um, I, you know, I think, Gus, I think we t obviously talked about this when I was on last time, but <clears throat> I, I have said I've talked about how golf changed my life when I started playing. but. What, what John is talking about, like he, he casually says, you know, Jim McMahon has been, I think yeah. I told you, the very first celebrity tournament I played in, I went to play the practice round, and I got over to the cart and turned the bag tag over, and it said Bart Starr. And <laughs> for me, I mean, I was this guy from New York. I mean, I, I grew up in Yankee Stadium watching the Giants play and Bart Starr, I couldn't talk for five holes. I couldn't, I kept looking at him and going, it's Bart Starr. I mean, all, all are at, we all wanted to be athletes. Every actor wanted, right? I, I do too. I yeah, want to be yeah. one too. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but but to get, because of golf, we have gotten to be friendly with our heroes, with guys yeah. that we idolized. 
yeah. all over the world we get to play with them. So, I, so Bart you Starr, get you, you mentioned Bart Starr, Matthew, and I played the Vince Lombardi tournament in Milwaukee, out of, outside of Milwaukee, and I was in my hotel, and we were getting ready to go over to the golf course, and I get in the elevator. The elevator door opens, and Bart Starr is there, and I went, holy cow, that's Bart Starr. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We would all do that. We would all do that. Yeah. If we saw. So yeah. does that make you guys pretty competitive? Like, okay, I'm going to play with Bart Starr, right? And now I – I have a chance to beat Bart Starr and something. No, right? you got to compete. No. no, you're just like happy to be no. there. No, no, you just, no, you just don't no. want to embarrass yourself in front of Bart yeah. Starr. Right? Please let me hit the ball in front of Bart Starr. That's so your dream ball. So, what is that? What is worse? Like when all the fans are lined up along, you know, because some of these pro ams, you know, there's people lined up along the tee box. Yeah. Right. What yeah. is harder for you guys? Is it hitting the ball to all those people there or hitting in front of somebody that like like a Bart Starr? Hitting uh, in front uh, of Bart Starr. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, if you hit one of those people, big deal, right? You just don't give them a, your golf club and they're okay. I mean, yeah, they got a big goose egg, but you, they'll be all right. You know, the first time, this is funny though, the first time I played in the Crosby, in North Carolina, which was the <laughs> absolute biggest golf tournament any of us ever played in. It was three days, two-man teams, hundreds of people there. My brother, Mitchie, had played in it the year before. And he said to me, before I came, when you get to the first tee, ask your the guy you're playing with to put the ball on the tee for you. Make a joke. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm telling you, your hand will be shaking. There'll be 300 people <laughs> behind the tee, and you won't be able to put the ball on the tee. And I got there. I said, sure. I got there and went to – I could tell I couldn't do it. So I called Woody over, and I said, I'm a star. Put the ball on the tee. <laughs> My hand was shaking. There were so many people there. And we're even if we're good, we ain't that good. We don't do it for a living for goodness sake. So, you know, for me, I would rather hit a ball in front of Bart Starr than 200 people. That's just me. Yeah, well, I mean, it is, like, even if you screw up in front of Bart Starr, it's one person, but the other people, they're probably, right. nowadays they have their phone out. Back then, nobody was oh, yeah. taking a picture of anything. You know, I remember right. a lot of those days. So, yeah. John, let me let me get to, uh, you, you were born in Springfield, Mass., Right. And how long did you live there before you went to high school in Connecticut? Well, we moved to Connecticut when I was six months old. So I was oh, born so in you Springfield. right away. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I was only six months old. We moved. Oh, to, I didn't and, know that. And, awesome. and, it, and it's only right across the border. It's only five miles away. The border in Springfield and Enfield, where I grew up, are right on the border. So they're five miles apart from each other. And, uh, um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Enfield and, you know, I, did you play a lot? I, did you play sports growing up? Yeah, I played four years of football in high school and two years in college. Did How about you? that, Gus? How about that? He's a football player. Defiance, <laughs> right? You went to Defiance, right? Defiance and, College. Yeah, we were my the, my first year. We were nine and zero, oh, and uh, wow. And, uh, we, uh, yeah, we had a really good team. Kirk Wait. Me, Kirk Me was our coach, and he was really strict, and. Um, he, he eventually went to Wisconsin, and then he went to the uh, Washington Redskins after that. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, that's great. But, I, got, I got a question. Yeah. You froze. You so froze. Matthew, what do you think? Oh, sorry about that. So I want everybody out there to try and guess what position John played in, in football. So uh, put it in the chat. Matthew, what <laughs> position do you think John played? Oh, he was uh, absolutely a slot receiver because he was very thin and not that tall. <laughs> John All right. was a big guy. I'm I know he was. I, I'm saying he was. You were an offensive lineman. Uh, I, I I think he was a linebacker. Right there, Gabe said Mike Backer. Gunner said wide or Dan said wide receiver. Uh, Gunner said free safety. I think you played defense. Uh, but I don't I was, know. Has anybody else got you're right. anything? You're right. I was a defensive end and a linebacker. Yeah. Oh, see. But, but I so also – like hitting quarterbacks. That's basically but, it. But, you know, in those days, Gus, because you're too young to notice, 
But uh, <laughs> in in those days, we went both ways. We played no, offense and de- yeah, we played offense and defense. And when I was in high school, I never left the field from the kickoff to the end of the game. I was on the punt team, the kickoff team, offense, <laughs> defense. I never left the field. What did and you play on we, offense? And my high school uh, coach was a was a DI instructor in the Marines, and he was a oh tough boy. dude. And, <laughs> and we, did you ever we grab were, your face mask? Oh, yeah. You know, I got a funny story for you. I had rheumatic fever when I was a kid, you know, when I was little. So I would have to get my heart checked every now and then. So I missed practice one day because I had to go get my heart checked. So I go, pra- like that. I go to the practice the next day, and he goes, Ashton, where were you yesterday? And I didn't want to tell him, you know. So I said, well, you know, I had some things and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, Kyle, where were you? So I finally told him, look, coach, I had, you know, rheumatic fever. I had to get my heart checked every now and then. He goes, four laps. So I, <laughs> so I go out to the track, which is a quarter mile track, four laps is a mile, full gear. And every time I go by the cross finish line, he's yelling at me, how's your heart, Ashton? How's your heart? <laughs> so I got a great story like that, John. My, so my father-in-law was my high school football coach. And Harry sounds like a lot of, like your coach. And I missed a practice because I had to go to the dentist. My mom's like, you got to go to the dentist, right? And I'm like, okay, I'll go. And and then I'm walking into practice, and I'm, I'm about an hour and a half late. And I'm just de- bebopping in like no big deal. I'm the quarterback, whatever. He's yelling from hallway like two fields over, and I can hear him. And he's just yelling my last, Frat, what do you think this is? Anybody, you can just come anytime you want. So same thing. <laughs> I get my pads on. I come out, and he's waiting for me. I didn't run laps. I did bear crawls and um, barrel rolls, 200 yards each. Uh, Never miss another practice again. (laughs) Yeah, that's just how they were back then, right? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, now Matthew was kind of hinting on this before, but uh, I got into acting because I was a juvenile delinquent. I mean, I, you know, when I I grew up, I was, we were stealing cars and breaking into hardware stores. (laughs) I mean, dumb (laughs) stuff. Dumb Wait, stuff, what kind of you know? cars were you stealing? Oh, anything that would run, you know. It was like, and I had a probation officer. I was in jail. I mean, it was, and uh, hello, you still there? Yeah, we're still there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I, I mean, I was really. So, I'm walking down my uh, hallway in my school one day, and the direct and the director of our high school came up to me. He said, "You want to be in a play?" And I said, yeah, sure, you know. And uh, it ended up being Oklahoma. I played Judd Fry and I won Best Actor. And all of a sudden, I got uh, a call to go into the Hartford Stage Company to do a, a walk-on thing in Othello. And and uh, anyway, I was 2 o'clock in the morning. We were rehearsing. I'm watching. I'm in the audience watching the other actors. And I really said to myself, you know, I could be out on the street getting in trouble right now. And instead, I'm sitting in here learning something, you know. And and then I, I gave the speech to my undergraduates, uh, and that was during the Vietnam War. And I saw everybody laughing and enjoying themselves. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to take people out of, away from all the crap that's going on in the world and entertain people. And, and this is my social work. And uh, that's when I decided to be an actor. And even when I went to college, I went to Defiance. I played football, but it was also in the theater. And uh, I was in Cape Cod. I was doing summer stock. I was making 25 bucks a week in room and board. And I had a wife and a four month old baby. And I said to myself, wow. you know, I could, I could be the greatest actor in the world, but who the hell is going to know it in defiance of Ohio, you know? Right. So, right. so I p- applied to USC and I uh, got accepted in the drama program there and I quit football and just de- devoted myself to my craft. That was probably pretty hard to quit football. I mean, it is, but in college, it's a lot more work than high school. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Oh yeah. Kirk me was tough. We were doing three a days all the time. And, and actually I want to, I, I wanted to switch the fullback. I wanted to play fullback and we already had a, a guy and, you know, so, it, but you know, I, I wanted to dedicate myself to, I said, look, I'm not going to make a living doing playing football. I knew that then. I mean, this was 1968, 67. Right. And I said, and I said, I want to concentrate on what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know? Well, well those guys back then didn't make, that much of a living anyway. No, right? no, right? not like, at all. 
There were probably a lot of guys that could have played but didn't because they probably made more money working in a mill or doing something else. You well, know, 25 I, bucks a week at room and board in Cape Cod wasn't a whole hell of a lot. Either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, got, I just, I got to say something here. Um, first of all, if I had known you were a juvenile delinquent, I never would have associated with you. <laughs> Number one. This, Gus, this is what's so great about this. I never knew that stuff about John because even when we first met, we just had fun and we talked about acting and whatever we did. And then through the years, how about this, John, you know, the first play I ever did ever. What? Oklahoma. Wow. And you I played, played Curly. You I played, played Curly. Curly in Oklahoma. Uh, see, I, I guessed it. Exactly right. Hey, I got, okay. Well, I got a great story. I got a great story about Oklahoma. I was playing a golf tournament in Manchester, England, with Howard Keel. Was the I was the host. there. Yeah, I was and, there. in Manchester with Danny yes. Chambers and all that, right? Yep. So, yep. so uh, Johnny Mathis was at that tournament, and he had a tournament we were going to in Ireland right after Howard's tournament. So. We're in the car going to the golf course, and Howard and I are in the car, and he I, he finds out that I did Oklahoma, and of course he played Curly on Broadway, so he we start singing "Poor Judd is Dead" in the car. Oh. Right? <laughs> so so uh, after we get done, Howard says because we had the show to do that night, and it was a black tie event that night. Yeah. And he goes he goes, "You want to do this at the show tonight, Ashton?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." We go to the show. Johnny Mathis is up on the stage just knocking people out. I mean, he had the place, and we got to follow Mathis, right? <laughs> so I go over to Howard. I like, crawl over to Howard at the table, and I go, you want to follow that, Howard? And he goes, come on, kid. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. So Johnny gets done, and the, the audience is mesmerized. And then Howard and I get up and sing, poor Judd is dead and brought the house down. So I can always say I followed Johnny Mathis and brought the house down. That is <laughs> awesome. This is that is best. awesome. You know, and so when did you start playing golf, John? I was bartending at a pool hall in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a pretty rough area in South Central LA, right near the Coliseum. And I had a a little Murphy bed apartment for 85 bucks a month there too. So I was pretty broke and I was bartending and a lot of cops hung out there. And uh, one of them came in one day and said, Hey, my wife bought me some new clubs. Who wants to buy my old ones? And they were old Walter Hagen. <laughs> I mean, nice. these they, yeah. So I said, okay, I'll buy them. So I bought them for 50 bucks and they, they sat in my apartment for six months at least and one day I had nothing to do, and I looked at him. And I said, "I think I'll take those and go play." And I was hooked. I went out and played, and went to wow. Griffith Park and played. And and uh, well, did you? So you you got to be a natural athlete. Like, did you have you taken lessons? No, no. I was just I picked him up and went out there and teed it up and went. You know, and he was a, he was like eight handicaps. Like first time he played, Matthew. What do you think about that? Doubtful, doubtful at that. <laughs> but, but I, uh, <laughs> I never, I never took a lesson either. I didn't start playing until I was 31 when I moved out to L.A. I've said this. We used to beat the crap out of guys that played golf where I grew up, when I grew up. Mm -hmm. we right. we, I was going traveling to into the city to play <clears throat> basketball on playgrounds. I mean, if you played golf, you had money and you belonged to a country club and you right. wore those pants. I mean, nobody – we didn't want to do that. Uh, yeah. so I didn't start till I moved to LA. I was 31. My brother Mitch was out there. He had started playing, which I I ridiculed him for for years. And I got out there and started playing. And uh, I mean, it for all of us actors, you know, when we weren't working, we were playing golf six days a week, right, John? If you don't, right. if you weren't working, you were playing. And yeah. how many how many jobs did people get because of somebody they met on the golf course or, you know, yeah. hey, it goes a long way. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it changed all of our lives. It really did. And Gus, Gus, you'll, Gus, you'll appreciate this. When I when I did that play in high school. Right. All my 
juvenile delinquent buddies, you know, <laughs> or college. You know, you know, be an actor in the theater. Of course, I was going to agree to, you know, the. the oh, yeah, they weren't. I'm sure they weren't actor. trying to. I was going to be yeah. the actor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, and then all, all my football buddies were, were teasing me about being an actor, and all my actor friends thought I was some stupid jock, you know. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> so I didn't fit in anywhere. <laughs> you still I think don't. you did. Yeah, <laughs> I think you fit in very well. Uh, but so, John, did you know that Matthew was in a circus? The circus? Oh, no. Yeah, I, I got to show you this. Yeah. I got to show you this picture. This, where, where'd it go, Gunner? We had it up. <laughs> where is it? I don't know. You my 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 screen shrunk too. Yeah, they're trying to get the picture up. No, oh, okay. I don't well, know later. what happened to it, but we had a great picture of Matthew in his circus costume. Doing yeah. what? Doing what? All right. It was, I'll tell it was you. sweet. It was sweet. I'll tell you what it was, John. All right. I used to get these calls, as I know you did. Did I want to do Battle of the Network Stars or did I want to do this show or that? And I always said no. Because right. I was a serious actor. Terrific. No serious yep. actor does that. Anyway, yep. one day I got a call from my agent. They would like to meet with me to do a little show every Thanksgiving they did called Circus of the Stars. And I said, I'm not going to do that show. What do they want me to do? And they said, they want you to walk the high wire. And I thought you know what? I'm going to go talk to them because when in my life would I ever get a chance to do this? Mm -hmm. so I went and met with them and it turns out that the guy that was training the three of us to do it was one of the guys that walked with the Walendas, the most wow. famous high wire oh, yeah. family ever. Absolutely. And I decided to do it. And so for Circus of the Stars... I walked the high wire. I rode a bike across the high wire. Well, do we, right. we, we, yeah, that's but we, you were, that's right there. But you we were, did attached. it with no net. You were, yeah, no, there was a net. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a, didn't they have a safety belt on you too or something? Or you were, when just we were playing? rehearsing, but not when we did the show. When you did the no. show, you actually, you did it without a harness or anything? Yeah, I'll send you the video. Wow. That's right. Wow. Wait, that's so. Right. That has to be more terrifying than hitting a, a ball in front of 300 people. Oh, yeah. That was that was pretty terrifying. I, I couldn't but do it. By that time, <laughs> after about six weeks, um, I actually did comedy up there. I was the comedy relief. I rode a bike across it with a wheel that was an oval. So every time it went up and down, every time I did the pedals the bike would go up and down i mean wow I got wow i'm an incredible athlete he uh, is along with being very humble i'm an incredible <laughs> athlete so i just picked it up and i did it you know that's what we how, how, how high off the ground is that 20 feet 20 feet yeah now that that's that's pretty intense that's pretty intense yeah. so you'll love, john you'll love the picture when you see the picture oh man that's that, i i couldn't do it but not me yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't like heights anyway, you know. I go to I go I, I go to do a movie. I said, don't put me above the fourth floor because I don't like heights. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that wouldn't be good. They always so want to give me a give me a suite like on the 27th floor, and I go, no, put me down on like two or three, all right. <laughs> so, so John, you're living in your little apartment out in Cali and you pick up golf. What was the first gig you got that you got paid kind of well for? Well, it was a, a stupid little independent movie called, I think it's called Psychopath now. Uh. And uh, at the time it was called, uh, I can't remember what the original title was, but actually it was, a, I, I, there was an actor that saw it. And years later he said, you know, they ought to redo that because we did it for like a buck and a half. And it was the, our, my, one of the directors in my theater program at USC, his nephew was directing it, and he saw me do a couple of plays at school, and and wanted me to do this. So it was a little independent, crazy little thing, and you know. What year? What year were you on Mash? Seventy two or three, seventy three, maybe. 
Wow. Yeah, that was, I love that picture. I don't hear Gunner. Wait, can you pull that up Gunner? Let's see. I think we got it right here somewhere right here. Yeah, oh, there, yeah. yeah. there we go. Oh yeah. What a Man, handsome you, guy, huh? I know. Look at that. One. He looks like a juvenile delinquent in that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the look I had when I would go to my probation officer all the time. Yeah. Well, that's where he probably <laughs> told you you were going to go if you don't straighten up. Right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah no, that, I'm, I'm that, not that's... Well, I'm not that's kidding. Great. You know, so, most most of the guys I grew up with are no longer with us because you know. But yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. Well, they'll be with us, but they might not be. They might be behind bars. Sounds like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got. Uh, let me see. I'm going to bring Terry up because I think Terry wants to ask a question here. Let me see. Who? Terry, you there? I'm here. All right, you got a question for John or Matthew? Uh, yes, actually, it's for John. Um, I heard that Sylvester Stallone and uh, Mickey Rourke were slated to play Axel Foley before Eddie Murphy was. Is that true? True. That's true. Uh, really? Uh, Mickey, Mickey Rourke was first, and then Stallone, and then Eddie. And I, wow. the, my, my first audition was when Mickey Rourke was doing it. And then I auditioned and like uh, didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. And then they called me back and uh, I auditioned again when Stallone was doing it. But then Stallone wanted to make it because uh, it was originally a very gritty movie. It was a very great. And Mickey work was was uh, uh, um, his, his best buddy gets killed in Detroit and he goes to avenge his buddy's death and all that. So it was a very gritty movie. And then when Stallone was going to do it, he started to make it, you know, Rambo blows up Beverly Hills or something. And uh, so, and then he went and did Cobra or something. And then when Eddie took it, then it, it became a comedy. But the script really never... script. So I'm... We lost yeah. John. All right. But it's pretty amazing, Matt. You know, you think that they did they have you been in anyway, yeah. they changed it like that? Eventually, uh, it was they yeah, were originally uh work and then Salon and then it they made a comment. He's just we're just gonna keep him like that. We lost you a little bit there, John, but you know, um, how hard is that for you that if you're reading a script and all of a sudden it changes from like drama, action to like comedy? Was that tough for you? Can you hear us, John? Are we back? Yeah. Can you hear us? Hello. I don't know if you can. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Matthew? Yes. I don't know what, what happened to John. He disappeared on us. It's somebody, Colorado. Hello. You know, somebody stole <laughs> oh, his microphone. Is. Yeah. It's still freezing. That's a really tough thing to do. I mean, it never happened to me, but to go from Mickey Rourke to Stallone to Eddie, and obviously the entire movie changed. Uh, the great thing is, John was going to do that movie when it was Mickey Rourke or Stallone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I lost you there, I guess. Yeah, we lost you too. I lost you somewhere. Can you hear us, John? Hey, Gunner, can you type in and tell John to maybe refresh his uh, computer there? Hit the little circle thing up there. Um, yeah, no, that would be difficult, right? And I oh, always yeah. wonder, I always wondered for you guys, like I've watched a lot of between you and John, I've watched a lot of the skits. Like you can catch, you know, parts of it all on YouTube. So you can watch a bunch of different skits. And right. John plays a lot of different characters. And so do they write that into the script? Like you got to be like this, or do you just see the line, understand who that character is, and then take it off on your own tangent? Well, you, I mean, when you get a script and you're, you first get it, you have something in common with that character usually, or they wouldn't be 
seeing you to play that part. Um, and then it's a question of making it your own uh, and obviously working with the director who is who is there to pull out that that performance from you. Uh, a lot of times it depends on the director. You'll have a director where you can go to him and say, I think it would be better if I said this. And right. they'll go, yeah, that that is better. There are some directors that go, you know, that's the script. You know, don't now. John is is so legendary that he could probably go to a director and just say, this sucks. I'm doing it this way. And they would let him. I would think. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. well, uh, not probably at first, right? I mean, when you're young, do they like no, tell no, you? No, not when you're young. After it's you're like being a rookie, up. right? It's like being a right. rookie. You're not allowed to talk. Right. Like you just do what we tell you. Right. Sure. Yeah. Same thing. Um, but you know, he he obviously, you know, when you're starting out, you're so most people, most actors are so nervous and I'm so, losing. I'm losing guys, you know. Yeah, well, we lost you a long time ago, John. <laughs> That's right. Um, We're gonna get John back. That the, the yeah. winds changed in Colorado, so we lost him. That's it's very possible. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not. He's. Uh, I think he's in Fort Collins. I think is where John is. Uh, although he travels a great deal now, um, but you know, the, the the. I think I told you this too. The first movie set I was ever on was Prince of the City. And I had, you know, two scenes to do that day. And I I don't think I've ever been that nervous before or after because I was working with some great actors and one of the best directors that ever lived in Sidney Lumet. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I had nightmares before that first day. I mean, yeah, I really, I could imagine. you know, um, it's pretty amazing phenomenon that first day of work when you're. Hey, back. I'm still here, you know. Oh, you are. Uh, no, you're back. Oh, I'm back now. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, good. Yeah, I was you, done. You, I, we you thought you got sick of us. Yeah, you were at. I... You were at Stallone. Uh, you were finishing up. You did it with Rourke, and then Stallone, and then with Eddie. That's where you. Well, were. yeah. Um, I don't know if she's still there or not, but. Uh, Strangely and strangely enough, Matthew, and you'll you'll appreciate this. I got a call for Beverly Hills Cop in nineteen like nineteen eighty three two something like that, and a casting director wanted to meet me, so I went into Paramount and met the casting director. She was lovely, and I can't remember her name. I'm sorry that I can't remember her name, but she said to me flat out, Matthew. She said, "John, there is absolutely nothing in this film for you." But I saw you and Ed, Ed Harris do True West at South Coast Rep, and I loved your performance, and I just wanted to meet you as an actor. And Wow. So, so I said, well, thank you very much. And that was the <laughs> end. You know, that was the end of it. And Eddie Harris and I did True West down at South Coast Rep, and we oh. both both won the Drama Logs Awards and all that stuff. But she just wanted to meet me. And then a couple of weeks later, not even a couple of months later, I get a call that says, they want to see you for Beverly Hills Cop. So I, I, okay. So I go in and they gave me one piece of paper. And it was the scene where I punch Eddie in the stomach when I say, we yeah. don't like this smart mouth kid from out of town and all this stuff. So I read it, right? And I get done and I don't hear anything for a month, right? And all of a sudden I get a call. They want to see you for Beverly Hills Cop. And I said, okay, you know, and I, you know, <laughs> now, now it is switched to Stallone, I guess, you know. So I go yeah. in. They give me the same piece of paper, the same scene. I read the scene, boom, thank you very much, I leave. Don't hear anything for another month or so. You know how that is, Matthew. Yep. And all of a sudden, I get a call. They want to see it for Beverly Hills Cop. I said, you got to be kidding me. So <laughs> I go in. Now Eddie was doing it, you know. So uh, anyway, by the fifth callback, yeah. uh, there were like tons of guys in the, in the hallway, and they were mixing and matching people. And uh, they, by chance, put Judge and I together. And uh, they said, okay, you two, you two, you two. And it was total by accident. So Judge came over to me and he said, hey, man, what'd you think of the script? And I said, uh, I don't know, I haven't read the script. And he goes, <laughs> he said, you haven't read the script? And I said, 
No, they just kept giving me this one page. I said, man, I don't know. I have no idea what this movie's about. So he goes, oh, my God, you know, and now we got to read together with all the producers and the writers and, you know, for oh, the screen te a screen test thing. And the judge is like, oh, my God. So I said, ah, don't worry about it. We'll just wing it, you know. So, so he goes, okay. So we go into the office, and there's a guy reading for the captain and me and judge and Marty and, and Bruckheimer and Simpson and everybody's in their room. So I just, you know, we're, we start doing stuff and I'm ad libbing stuff, you know, and then I, I finally look at the other guy and I said, uh, can I talk to you alone for a minute? And I look at judge and I said, I want to talk to the captain alone. And judge kind of looks at me and goes, oh, okay. You know, and so I look up, I look up at the guy and I go, can I get another partner? Because this guy's a real pain in the ass, you know. <laughs> the, the, the whole room cracked up and I got the job because of that, you know. So, oh, this uh, is so great. That is, <laughs> awesome. that is awesome. So I have a question for uh, you. about. So you guys probably see, like, when you watch sports, you hear all about our contracts and the difference between NBA, NFL, and all that. How does it work in film? Like, do they give you options or is it, like, you know, this is what we're giving you and that's it. Like, so that, cause you hear about, you can take a percentage of what the movie makes or you just. Hey, how do I with Gus listeners manscaped? They sent me, uh, they hooked me up with a bunch of tools and formulations for their package 3.0 kit. Uh, so you know, I want to show you guys what's in the perfect package, right? We all think we got a perfect package, but they sent me the perfect package 3.0 kit. I want to show you what they sent me. So it was crazy. It came in this great box. Um, you know, and you can see what it says. They will thank you because they send us this awesome trimmer. They sent us, uh, you know, stuff that makes you smell better. And then, uh, you know, they sent me this great... Uh, some boxers even, which you get, right? Protect them. And then, uh, you know, they sent me this uh, cool sack, I guess you want to call it, to store all your stuff in. So uh, it's been great. Uh, Manscaped sent me a bunch of product, um, you know, and, and, you know, you can see it all on here. Uh, you know, you can go to manscaped.com and put in the code... Uh, Gus Ferrat, that's G-U-S-F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E, get 20% off and free shipping when you use that code, but you can get a kit, you can get individual items, like um, this way cool groomer that has a little LED light, um, ceramic, uh, these things come apart, they're waterproof, you can do a lot with them, so, uh, you know, Manscaped is great. You know, it's, it's funny. I remember when I was playing with the Denver Broncos, and I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, there was a gentleman who was playing on our team, and uh, you know, if he ever hears the story, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, he brought his own clippers in one time, and he used it to trim his beard up, his goatee, and everything. And uh, he had them there for about two or three weeks, and he goes in around the corner, he walks in. And there's a person, another player, that is actually manscaping with his beard trimmer. So, you know, one of the things is, you don't wanna use the same trimmer down there that you use up here. So, uh, he kind of freaked out a little bit and he said, hey, how long have you been using that tool there? And he said, well, it showed up here about three weeks ago and I've been using it ever since. So, you know, there is a lesson learned that, uh, you know, don't leave things out and probably, if it would have just said manscaped on it, we wouldn't have had that issue. But it's probably one of the funniest uh, taking care of your ball stories I've ever heard or been around in the locker room in the NFL. So uh, it's a great story. Um, but, you know, I always said there was no way to know. There was no name on it. And the guy was just using it. And another guy was using it. It, it, it was not good. But it's a heck of a funny story. So one of the best I've ever heard in my 15 years playing in the league um but you know there's so many great things about manscaped and, and what they're doing uh because guys you got to take care of yourself even though i got gray hair um and getting older but uh, you still have to maintain some sort of uh grooming right and so um 
you know, we all work out. For me, I like working in my yard, doing those things now that I'm retired, getting a little sweat on and everything. You want to smell good. Uh, you know, you got to take care of yourself. They got some great products. Um, you know, this one, a little uh, ball deodorant. We all need that here and there. Um, after, you know, working in the yard, taking a hike, doing a walk, whatever you do, um, it's a great thing. But uh, there's so many great products. Um, I want to thank Manscaped for sending them to me. Um, the Lawnmower 3.0, obviously, you can use it anywhere in your body. But I'm sure you guys have all seen the commercials. But uh, this is one just letting you know that uh, the Lawnmower 3.0 comes with the perfect kit. You can buy the Lawnmower by itself. You can buy all these products individually. They even sent me this wonderful shirt. And you can see the back. Your balls will thank you. And then the, here's the front. So it's an awesome shirt. They have great gear. And you know what? Sometimes you can just sit back, take care of your balls a little bit, and, and, and read the paper. So I think Manscaped even has their own daily news, So which is great. So don't forget that uh, you can go to the code Gus Ferrat, and uh, that's G-U-S-F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E, uh, and you can save 20% on any products, the complete, the perfect uh, package gift set, and uh, you know, you can save 20% and get free shipping. So use the code Gus Ferrat, G-U-S-F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E. Hey, everybody spells my name wrong. They even spelled it wrong in the back of my Pro Bowl jersey, so... You know, I got I to gotta help you guys out. So don't forget how important it is that you use these products. Take care of yourself down below and have some fun, right? There's nothing closer to you than your little buddies. So use the lawnmower. Uh, use the code Gus Ferrat. Save 20% and get free shipping and uh, order some great Manscaped products. just get a straight forward pay how did that does that always change every movie mm -hmm. well it changes not only by the movie but by the actor i mean with all the stuff mm -hmm. obviously that i did in my career and i did a lot of stuff i never got to that point i made more money as i went along but um i you know if, if i were as big a legend as john i would have said i get 50 percent of the gross or i'm not doing it I mean, that's, <laughs> I was yeah. but um, it's a negotiation. They, they say, here's what your agent says. Here's what they've offered. Do we take it or not? No. They go back and make an, a counter offer and they go back and you decide uh, if that's good enough or not. I mean, that's always the way it worked for me. Yeah, well, no, that's pretty interesting. What about you, John? Well, Gus, not only that, with everything going on today, with the streaming, with Amazon and Netflix and stuff, those yeah. kind of con those kind of contracts are weird now. I mean, you know, you used to be able to say, "I want two percent of the gross or whatever," right. you know, yeah. and and now it's like, well, there's no box office. Look at this thing that Scarlett Johansson just went through. Her contract yeah. was based on box office revenue. Well, there right. wasn't any. They took they took the movie and took it right to streaming. So there is oh, no box I office. Yeah, so that's not right. This yeah, is totally so, she, so she sued him and won. She got ten million dollars out of it, but but I mean, now you can't make now that those negotiations are way different than they used to be. You yes. know, because you got all this streaming. If you say I want part of the box office and it goes straight to to Amazon, well, you're not going to see any box office, are you? So no, that's 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 a good point. So I'll tell you a story. I was playing for the Broncos and I had a, a an incentive in my contract. So it was either I get so many plays or I play in so many games or I start so many games. And um, it's kind of funny. It sounds like that. Uh, so I miss all my incentives by one. I miss, I was should have started the last game. I didn't start. I should have the coach. We were beating somebody. He took me out with one play to go. And I didn't know where I was in all this deal. So I missed everything by one and I lost, you know, $500,000 and I go oh, in afterwards right. and I get arbitration involved and right. they said, no, there's nothing. It's like on paper, this is how many plays you had. You had to reach this point. And I went to the coach and I said, 
you're really not going to give this to me? And he said, no, I don't have to. And I'm like, but you see other guys who had, were going to get a bonus for less. We would throw them three or four balls in that game so they could make their catch amount and get a bonus, <laughs> right? And I was like, are you serious? Yeah. And that just rubbed me the wrong way. But it sounds similar. Like wow. in the NFL, we can get we can get really guys. People don't understand. Like we can really get screwed over in the NFL because it's almost a one-way contract. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep. Well, you know, Gus, I, I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I've always felt with my business and sports business, I've always felt that everyone should be involved in the revenue of, of the product. Right. That that one guy shouldn't be making twenty five million and the other guy's making ten thousand. Yeah. They should all all be at an equal level, and and you get you get bonuses. Everything. Let's say the box office goes to ten thousand ten million dollars. Everybody gets a piece of that. It goes right. to twenty million. Everybody gets a piece. Like if you win. 20 games as a pitcher, you get so much more money, you know? Right. So it, it, I, I just think both of our businesses sh should be based on production and, and, and quality and what you bring. You know, if you're, if you're very successful, everybody should enjoy, enjoy that success. I think. No, that's so true. That's so true. So like when you, when I go in and be a backup quarterback, and the starter is making 10 million. I get base salary, which was 850,000. And right. then I end up playing in 12 games. There's right. no bonus, you know, there was no bonus. So this guy's just sitting on the bench. And I'm like, why don't you give me what he's supposed to be? Give it <laughs> yeah. to me. Right. I know. It. So I know. It. All right, John. John, we got another question here from Armando. He wants to know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure you remember some kind of wonderful. Did he know it would become one of the greatest 80s movies of all time when he when you were shooting it? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't believe me. I don't think in those terms. And Matthew knows this as an actor. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't go on a set going, oh, I'm going to be a star from this or I'm going to this is going to win an Academy Award or I go and do my job. I, yeah. I go in and do my job and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, I don't think of those things. I really don't. And uh, there's a, actually a funny story. When I was doing Cop 2, Beverly Hills, because I did some kind of wonderful after Beverly Hills Cop. Mm -hmm. And then we were shooting Beverly Hills Cop 2, and they were editing some kind of wonderful because I did it right before we started that. Well, I get a call and they say, we got to reshoot a scene in some kind of wonderful. And I was on the set for Beverly Hills Cop, right? So, or Be Cop 2. Right. And so they were both Paramount Pictures. And they wanted to reshoot the bedroom scene that I had with Eric because I mentioned the earrings and that he spent $10,000 on his earrings. And they, when they screened it for an audience, the audience couldn't believe that he would pay $10,000 from a working right. class family. So we had to just change that one section of the scene. So I had to go over to the other sound stage when I was shooting Cop 2, run over and reshoot some kind of wonderful bedroom scene. And I had two trailers on the lot. And John Ratzenberger, who plays Cliff the Mailman on Cheers, he comes over to me and he goes, you're the only actor that's got two trailers on the lot, you know, because <laughs> I had to have one for each show, you know. So it was, well, it was very you, funny. Did you have the stash in both movies? Uh, I don't think I had it in some kind of wonderful. Yeah, uh, so like. like maybe I did. Were, I don't know. Like if you're filming another movie that you have a certain <coughs> look, and then all of a sudden you got to go change that look, is that just makeup and they try? Well, to then I, I must have had it in some kind of wonderful then because they didn't, you know, <laughs> I couldn't grow it in a day, that's for sure. Yeah. So uh, well, yeah, or, no or cut it, cut it and grow it. But uh, anyway, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, no, it was uh, it was it was a great movie. John Hughes was terrific. I I did two movies with him after that. I did uh, she's having a baby with Kevin Bacon after that. Yeah. And, John well, was who, very, very loyal to his his. Who actors. was the guy? Like Matthew was talking about fanboying over somebody. Who was the? Have <clears> there <throat> ever been somebody that you worked with and you were like, "This is really cool." Like this guy, I've always wanted to work with him, or like I've, I've watched a ton of his movies, always wanted to meet him. You know, I don't, I don't really get, I don't get awed by you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I've worked with some terrific guy, De Niro, and and. You know Anthony Hopkins and I work oh, with some... oh, <laughs> just um, like uh, well the great thing know. the great thing about Hopkins I was doing a movie with him and uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. 
And I walked on the set the first day and I looked at uh, Cuba and I says, is it Cuba or Cuba? And he goes, yeah. it's Cuba. And I said, okay, thank you. Is it Sir Anthony, <laughs> Mr. Hopkins, Miss Sir Anthony? What is it? He goes, Tony. I go, great. I'm John. Let's go to work. You know? I love it. I love it. So I got to, so for both of you guys, like I was kind of like a prankster in the locker room, right? I love to pull pranks on people because I always felt like, I always felt like, yeah, I always felt like the laughter you get, and, and I wouldn't do it to people that didn't like it, right? I knew I right. get to know people, but right. did you guys have that? Like, did you ever work with somebody who was always a prankster, joking around with everybody or pulling pranks on them while you were on set or, you know, in the background? Mm, I, I don't know. Go ahead. I, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I don't think I ever worked with an actor that way, but I worked with crew members, that did that <laughs> yeah and when when crew members did it to you they were usually really good pranks oh I yeah mean, they have all they had all the time if you had a prop guy that was a practical joker and you were imagine. filming a scene and there was some rubber poop where there wasn't supposed <laughs> to be or i mean those are the times that that you really remember and those the crew the crew John's the same way the crew that's my guys and women John absolutely too. absolutely that's the thing oh. I miss the most about not acting anymore is my time with the crew and anytime they had a chance to, I came here's this is a great story I went to I was doing a my sitcom on Fox called Duet right. and in 1987. And I went to, I got an okay to take a week off from the show. No, we had a week break. And I went to New York to go to the World Series. The Mets were were playing, uh, 86. The Mets 86. were playing the World Series. So I leave for a week. And we were shooting on the stage at Paramount. And you have the back hall behind where the sets are are all the dressing rooms, one next to another. It's like a hotel right. with doors going down. And I come back from being in New York for that week, and I say hello to everybody, and I go make a left to go down the hall to my dressing room, which was in the middle of the hall. And here's Allison's dressing room. Here's Mary Page's dressing room. My dressing room is gone. In the week, <laughs> in the week that I left, they plasterboarded over it. They painted over it. It was gone. And everybody, the whole crew, were looking around the corner to see my reaction for when I <laughs> came down the hall. I mean, oh. they love doing stuff like that. And oh, I've, done, I, I've done that to a rookie before. Oh, see, rookie uh, hazing, I'm sure. Yeah, you do. That, that's normal. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, I was playing in Denver. We had this rookie lineman, Ben. I can't remember Ben's last name. Um, so everybody leaves after practice. I go and take, clean out his whole locker, take his name tag, everything. And I take one of our stalls in the bathroom and I make that his new locker. And, and he comes in the next morning and he's like, where's my stuff? And all the linemen were like, I, they knew what I was doing. They were like, I don't know. So he's looking all over and somebody said like, you better go look in there. And he goes in and that's his locker. It looks just like his locker had was out there. And all the linemen made him use that as his locker for the rest of the week. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Just a little rookie. Well, that wasn't as bad as I've heard before, though. The, yeah. the, one, the one prank that was done to me that it was very dangerous, actually. And uh, um, I, I was doing a play in L.A., and it was a hit play. It was called The Last Meeting of the Knights of the White Magnolia. Right. And it ran, it ran for nine months. It was a big hit. I mean, everybody, I mean, Charlton Heston would come back to my dressing room after the show. And I mean, you know, Neil Simon came to my dress. I, I was oh, like, him. Oh, oh him. him. Oh, him. You know, <laughs> he was only a god to me, you know. But uh, oh, he's fanboying uh, a little bit, Matthew. Yeah, he's fanboying but, a little bit. I would too. Bit, yeah. 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 But, but in, in the play, I played this, this alcoholic guy right and we're having the meeting of the night at nights of the white magnolia we're going to uh initiate a new member and stuff so there was no drinking and none of that so i'm i'm like getting a shake during the during the run of the play because i'm in this meeting and i want to get out and go have a drink and stuff and finally i find this bottle this 
pint of whiskey and I, I tell everybody to get away from me, you know, get away from me, you know, and I start chugging this pint, right? So, you know, of course it's Coca-Cola, you know, but right. so one night the stage manager puts real booze in the thing, right? Oh. And I got to chug this whole pint, which is, that would kill me. I mean, so I, I as soon as I got it to here, I went, oh my God, you know? <laughs> so I started to try to use it as spraying it around to everybody, yelling at people and stuff. And, but, you know, that was dangerous. And I went to the stage manager after. Oh, yeah, and, uh, that's bad. Had a little talk with him after. Let's put a it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were playing defensive end and making him the quarterback at that point. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. So we got another. Hey, hey, Gus. Gus, yeah. when were you with the Broncos? When, when were you with the Broncos? I was there in 2001, uh, 2000, 2001. So uh, that year in um, 2001, when the Raiders, or not the Raiders, but the Ravens won the Super Bowl, we played them in the first game of the playoff, first game, you know, after the season in the playoffs in Baltimore. And that was probably the best defense I've ever played against that year when they had okay. all those big, they were really wow. good. So, um, and we had a really good team. It's just their defense was darn good. Like that was yeah. a tough team. I mean, they, they walloped everybody. Whole way through so you were you were after John then, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So John was uh, before me. Um, Brian Greasy and I were there together, and then, but you know, there were still kind of holdovers that John knew. He didn't come around the facility too much, but like Gary Kubiak, who was um, yeah, his Gary was great. Was was my quarterback? Was my offensive coordinator and quarterback coach? Right, Gary's so, got. We we must have met somewhere along because John's a friend of mine. Gary's a friend of mine. And I used to play the yeah. golf tournament, the Denver, uh, the Broncos golf tournaments down there and stuff. And well, yeah, which which um, course was it? Because there's some amazing courses out there. The I one off, uh, the one off of Arapahoe Road. We used to play. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember that uh, course's name, but it's so much fun playing out there because you feel like a a, a pro golfer because you can hit it like 340 in that Denver area. I tell Matthew that every time I go back to Kentucky, I got to get used to the air. I'm used to 5,000 feet, you know, and yeah, down to I sea level. This is great. One summer I did, I never think of it. This, this is amazing. One summer I spent outside Salt Lake City doing a very famous 1950s musical called I Do, I Do. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is two people, a man and a woman, for about an hour and a half on stage. I can't believe I did that. I am so talented. It's just <laughs> anyway. How long anyway, did it take you to how long did it take you to memorize the script? Uh actually, all kidding aside, that was one thing I was always very fortunate about. Um I I had it I could learn scripts and, and parts really easily. I didn't always remember them when I got on stage, but for the most part I was. But anyway, they I lived about a half mile from a golf course for the whole summer in a place called Helper, Utah, outside Salt Lake City. And so during, I played golf every day, and then I would do the show at night. And the same thing. I mean, you're up near Salt Lake City, and I'm hitting my seven iron 220. You know, I'm like <laughs> up there I'm going every day. And I was you there never hit a, you never hit a seven iron two twenty in your life. Okay, a you six can, iron. You, okay. you could be you could be on the freaking moon and you wouldn't hit a two twenty. <laughs> okay, maybe it's five iron. Okay, maybe it's driver. Maybe. Anyway, let's just say I hit it a lot further. All right, all right. Okay. And I was there for two months, and then the show ended, and I get in my car and I drive back to LA, and I go to play probably at Griffith Park. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I can't play <laughs> golf like this anymore. It was horrible. I know exactly what you mean, John. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a course out there that the owner of Remax owns. I don't know if you ever played that one, John. Yeah, um, been many times, many times. And it is like that one. It's like a thousand foot drop and there's a herd of elk always on it. It was. It's just one of my favorite courses I've ever played. The and it five. was just a yeah. Sanc sanctuary. You're talking about yeah, sanctuary. That's it, sanctuary, yeah. It's like yeah. the par five, it's a dog leg right. Yeah. And you just tee it high and let it rip. And I mean, yeah. I've hit a, I've hit them 380 there, you know. And I'm thinking like in my head, like, man, that's a long way. And then then you see these guys on regular sea level, what's his name, hitting it 400 like it's nothing. Oh yeah. yeah. Deschambeau. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It's, it's yeah. crazy. So John, what do you have going on uh now? What are you up to? Well, there, there's serious talk going on about Beverly Hills Cop 4. 
So I'm waiting here on that. And, you know, this COVID thing kind of screwed things up. And I, I have a movie that just came out that I did with Bruce Dern called uh, Death in Texas. And we shot that down in New Mexico. And, uh, and then I have a movie that uh, came out a few years ago, Once Upon a River, taken from yeah. a book. And that's out on, uh, you can stream all those. So yeah. uh, right right now I'm just you know waiting to hear about cop four. Evidently I'm hope I'm in it. I mean I don't know if I'm in it, but uh, right that would be I, great. I, I talked to Judge the other day and we, neither neither one of us are uh, attached to it yet. And but I talked yeah. to him the other day and uh, he said, oh yeah, hey then we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll do this and I'll go, Judge, we even got the freaking job yet. Hold <laughs> it. <laughs> I just want you to recreate the scene where you fall in the pool. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I did that like 10 times, you know. Yeah, that was the that was the prank they played on you. You just didn't know it. They just kept saying, do it again. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, well, every time they change camera angles, you got to go get a dry yeah. suit and go do it again, you know. And so, no, I, uh, I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, you've been doing it for so long, and I'm, I'm so happy you're still doing it. Uh, thank you. And, thank and you. It's, it's just been amazing to have you as a guest on the show. I can't thank Matthew enough for, for asking you to come on. I mean, I'm sorry that we had a little... Uh, faux pas in the beginning, but no, no we, we got to where we needed to go. Um, and if anybody out there wants to go find John, you can go to his web, right? You have a website, johnashton.com. Yeah, I and, haven't up, I haven't updated it in well, a while. I heard your like. sister gets really mad at you for that. Yeah, how'd you know that? She does. Uh, she's, 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 how'd you know that? I know, <laughs> I know a lot more than you think. Oh, she, boy. Yeah, she's I might not be able team. to read a defense anymore, but I can find out some other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so she said to make sure that you update that because yeah, she's tired of not knowing what you're doing. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so Matthew, talking, what do you, what, what do you uh, did, John, do you know what Matthew's doing nowadays? Uh, he's working at the radio station in Lexington, right? How, That's right. How about, isn't that amazing that he has a he has a sports talk radio show. He has a golf show. I mean, Matthew, that's pretty amazing that what your career the, the the circles you've been in because it's tough to do. I've been there. It is. I'm the only. There it is. That's uh, look at that goofy picture. Um, <laughs> you must I'm be not, the one that picked that. No, actually, I'm not. Uh, and I will talk to somebody about that as soon as I get. <laughs> anyway, um, it's been. You know, I I've always said I have been the most blessed person to be able to have the acting career I did and then to go sit behind coach K at Duke for 10 years doing radio wow. and now being on ESPN radio and, you know, talking about sports and, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been pretty amazing. I'm really lucky. Actually. Yeah, and, and you're really good at it. So I've been on your show. It's, it's amazing. And it's a lot of fun. Well, thanks Gus. I got a suggestion for you, Matthew. Uh oh. Get a you on the oh. high wire and put that on that that poster to Matthew's Matthew. So, yeah, high wire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wait till wait till he sees this picture, Gus. We hey wait. hey John, you know what we need to do? We need to make it into a GIF, so it's just like going back and forth, oh. and, and put it on the cover for you. No, we don't. No, no, we don't. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, we don't. Well, John, look at, throws, look at his face. Like he froze. That, on the froze there. that was kind of scary. Yeah. So the other thing we got to do, Matthew, is we got to get John down to Kentucky. Yep. You know, we got to play some golf and then we'll get him on the tour with us. Go yeah. do a night of that. Oh, he'll believe me. He'll do the bourbon tour. Believe yeah. me. Yeah. Gus is what, coming to Lexington, right. John, and we're going to play golf and do the bourbon tour in the spring. Oh, okay, John. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. So <laughs> what's your favorite uh, Ashton movie, Matthew? Well, the two, I mean, the, the, are legendary, are obviously cop. Midnight Run is one of my absolute favorite movies uh, of, of all time. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it 30 times, and okay, I, it's just the most, everything about it is incredible. Everything about it, every performance, uh, the script, everything about it. It's I just uh, obviously, like I said, the cop movies are fantastic. Um, yeah, but for me, Midnight Run is oh, just so, 
So, John, I got one question, if we can get serious for a second, because it's all in the news right now. And you've you've been on sets where you've handled guns and all that. And it's what a shame that happened to Alec Baldwin. Right. Yeah. And, like, like, how what? does that how does that even happen? I mean, I, 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 I couldn't imagine what he's going through right now. Well, I can't either. I've, I've worked with Alec uh, when he did his uh, first TV series called uh, Cutter to Houston uh, with Shelly Hack. And I was a, yeah. a regular a regular on that. And I, so I've worked with Alec and, and Danny. I've done a couple of movies with his brother, Danny. So we're pretty good right. friends. And uh, I can't imagine what he's going through, man. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I've got I've got some pretty good guesses. And I'm sure Matthew does, too, about how that happened. But uh from uh, you know, I'm I'm like you. It's everything I read, so I'm trying to decipher what's really true and what's not. And, yeah, but well, it's uh, you know, like, and you have to trust the people around you, right? Like you, when you were when you were handling a shotgun, like in Midnight Run, yeah. you know, and you're putting the rounds in there, you're putting the the um, the shotgun shells in there. You know, you're trusting that there's really nothing in them, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you got there's a certain amount of trust, but. There's also got to be a certain amount of uh, your own responsibility too, you know. I mean, when when I'm on a set, because I I I know guns a little bit, so yeah. Um, and the prop guys, I uh, you know I respect them totally, and and uh, I always tell them, do not hand me the weapon until the camera is rolling, not be, not when they say get ready. Because they right. say get get ready, and then they hand everybody these loaded guns, and then somebody wants to tweak a light, and they go, "Wait a minute, we got to do this." Now there's a bunch of people standing around with loaded guns, and I don't like that because a yeah. lot of people don't know about guns, what they're doing. and they th- yeah, and they th- and they think they're toys, and they're not. And uh, so I tell the prop guy, "Do not hand me that weapon until the camera is rolling, and give it to me on safety. I will take the safety off." When they yell cut, I will hand you this weapon right back. And so stand right here off camera, and I will hand it right back to you. Now, some people don't do that. And believe me, and I'm not going to name names, but I've been around a lot of them. They start yeah. firing the guns and thinking they're toys, and and it freaks me out. <laughs> I just go, oh, I, 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 I can I, see your football mentality coming back there when they're doing that stuff. Right? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah You're yeah. back to your old high school coach. Yeah. I so, am. I, I, so I I, I I feel bad for Alec, but but and evidently it happened during a rehearsal. It didn't even happen during oh, a wow. shot. So yeah. he shouldn't even had a loaded gun at all for a rehearsal. Apparently, yeah. there was a lot of other stuff going on before that. Um, right. right. Than that, just that incident. So it's horrible. I there were a couple of jobs I had where I had to fire a weapon. One of them a lot. And that was Popeye Doyle that I did with Ed O'Neill. Right. And right. those prop guys, I mean, we're talking about in New York, playing cops, all this stuff. I never saw the weapon. I mean, we would rehearse with prop guns. Right. And rubber, the, guns. Uh, rubber, guns. rubber guns. Rubber guns. Rubber guns. Rubber guns. And right. I never saw a weapon, as John said, until right before action was said they would right. walk over take it out of their bag that they carried it in and hand it to me and that was it and, I mean, and, had, and they'll show you it. they usually show you the chamber and tell you yeah, look yeah, absolutely yeah yeah absolutely. so do you think do you think this will make have have a lot of changes happen now because of that well i well, think you, a lot you would yeah. hope so but you yeah. hope so but i think a lot of it was they were on a tight schedule. They were rehearsing. I mean, they were, I think uh, I read they had a 21-day shooting schedule. And I've been on those those schedules. Um, when yeah. I did my I did my TV series, Hardball, and we had a lot of weapons on that. And we were working 15, 16 hours a day. And, I mean, I'm telling you, you get tired after a while, and you start losing your concentration. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and that's, I've always felt that, I did a movie in, in, in France with Gerard Depardieu, who was a big star over there. Uh, just, just him. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, him. <laughs> oh, him. But but I, we did this movie, and we worked eight hours a day. That was it. That yeah. was it. And, I mean, you got to the set. They had breakfast for you there. You started your work at noon. Hello. You didn't start to – 
You didn't start till noon. And you got there at 8, 11 and had a little brunch or something. Start at noon. Around 4 or 5 o'clock, they'd bring a cart over with, with bagels and, you know, all these French oh, foods. Oh, man. Now I'm and you go, you go make yourself a sandwich, you know, and, and there, were, there was no break. You work eight straight hours at 8 o'clock, wrap, gone. Then you had time to go home to your family, have a dinner that yeah. night. I mean, it was really, really, and they got it done in the same amount of time. And then I went back to the States again, and I started kind of going, man, you go. So I went over to New Zealand to do a movie, and it was the same thing, 14 hours a day and out in the woods oh. at 3 in the morning and the freezing oh. rain. And, you know, and I'm going, you guys don't have a clue, man. What they, right. France was so wonderful. Man. <laughs> it's called civilized. France civilized. Is civilized. France. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So one last question for you, John. What's your favorite John Ashton movie or one that you're most proud of? I I gotta say Midnight Run. You know, uh, it was it was not only a great script, we had a great cast. Uh we were on the road six months doing that movie. We started literally wow. started started in New York and worked our way across the country and and uh it, it, we became really close family, you know, and uh and it was the experience was great. Uh, I loved playing Marvin Dorfler. I mean, I just melted into that character. And, yeah, you, and, you uh, could tell. Uh, I, I I didn't feel like it. I and laughed it, just thinking about it. <laughs> now, a funny story. <laughs> there, there's a scene. There's a scene where the two uh, mob guys take uh, Bobby and Chuck into the alley, and they got him in the alleyway. And then I pull up in the car and shoot the shotgun and knock him out and speak yeah. into the microphone and do all that stuff. Right, right. I love that scene. Well, we get get there in the morning, and I say to Marty, "Well, what do you, how do you want to do this?" And he goes. Well, you just walk across the street with your with the shotgun, hold it to your side, and walk across the street toward the alley. And I said, Marty, that's boring, man. <laughs> and he goes, Well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to drive into the shot and shoot the shotgun out, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, Great idea. So we stopped out everything, and they built this ramp for five hours. You're building all this stuff, and uh, you know, but that, but my, that's why I love Marty Bress, the director. He just gave us so much freedom and. Took, took her ideas, and you weren't just some robot act actor out there throwing lines out. He really wow. let you create that character, you know. And he yeah, did the I same. Mean, what a great character it was. He did the same in Beverly Hills Cop. I mean, yeah. and Beverly, he directed the first cop, Marty Brest. He's a wonderful director. And like I said before, that that script was was still the same gritty script that, that Mickey Rourke and Stallone had. But now we got a comedian and now we start changing things, and and Marty loved uh, the chemistry with me and Judge, and we'd shoot a scene where it said Taggart and Rose would wait in the car, and Judge and I would sit in the car and look at the window, and drink our coffee, and you'd shoot that like two or three times. You go, okay, we got that. Now you guys just play with it. So the next take, and Judge literally had a magazine in the car that he was reading in between takes. So he goes, okay, you guys just do something now. And he rolls the camera and <laughs> Judge picked up the magazine. He goes, wow, did you know by the time you're 50 years old, there's 12 pounds of undigested meat in your system? And I go, why are you telling me that? What, but what makes you think I have any interest in that at all? He goes, well, you eat a lot of meat, you know. And that, that was all ad-lib stuff, you know. And Marty gave us the freedom to do that, you know. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's probably what makes you the most happy when you when you when you can be an actor and have that kind of freedom. Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we're not robots. Give us to get you hired us for our talent. Let us let us use it. You know, let us create. You know, so and funny. it's amazing that when you watch a movie that where they make them robots, you can tell it right away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you were talking about you know being awed by certain actors and stuff. Well, when Midnight Run came up. I was at a play. I was watching Joey Pantaleono do a play. And uh, a good friend of mine in an intermission came up to me and said, well, you're going to do Midnight Run, aren't you? I go, I don't know. I haven't read it. You know, my Cracker Jack agent. Right, you know. right, yeah. right. I go, I go, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. He goes, oh, you're perfect for it. Uh, this was Alan Vint. I don't know if you remember Alan, uh, uh, Matthew. But yeah. any, anyway, uh, I call my agent and go, what's the deal? And they go, well, yeah, you'd be good in it. And I go, well, hello. hello. You know? yeah. So I get, a, I get a hold of Marty, and he goes, oh, you'd be great in it. He goes, well, you got to audition. You know? And I go, 
when I got an audition for you, Marty, I said, you know, we, you know, we did Beverly Hills Cop together. He goes, it's not me. It's Bobby. He wants to audition with everybody. Uh, and I learned, I learned a good lesson from him then. So I said, okay, that'd be great. That'd be great. So I go to the audition. Of course, there's 50 people out there, you know, in the hallway and everybody's freaking out, you know, Oh, I got to read with De Niro. I got to read with De Niro. And I'm like out there going, man, I couldn't wait. I go, I, I couldn't wait to go work, you know, to read with him, you know? And, and I said to myself, nobody's getting this part, but me, this is my part. This is my role. Nobody's right, getting this. Awesome. So I go in there and Bobby's there and we go, hi, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. So Marty goes, okay, you know, start the scene. So we start the scene. And uh, Bobby goes to hand me some matches. He picks up some matches and goes to hand them to me. So I, 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 I go to get them, and he drops them on the floor. And he stares at me. And I looked at him. I go, F you. And he goes, F you too. I go, go F yourself. <laughs> and and uh, he wanted me to pick them up and hand them. And I looked at him. I said, I ain't picking those up. So I found, I found out later when I walked out, George Gallagher, the writer, told me as soon as they walked out, Bobby said, "I want him," because he wanted <laughs> he wanted somebody to stand up to him. Stand up to him, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'll guarantee yeah. every other actor picked him up and said, "Oh, you're Mr. De Niro." And oh, I looked yeah. at him. I go and I looked at him. I went, "F you." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is and awesome. we got and we got along awesome. great. And and you know, I mean, when you and actually, I was supposed to get killed halfway through that movie uh, in the original script. And then Marty said, after about a month or two of shooting, Marty said, we can't kill Dorfler. Everybody will hate us. So, <laughs> yeah. so we got to the right. scene. So now they put me into the scene at the airport at the end and all that stuff. Yeah. But originally, I was supposed to be shot in Vegas when the bad guys, I show them a picture of Groden and they see the towels at a hotel and they know where he is. And they shoot me. In the original wow. script, they just shoot me. So now we get to filming that, right. that scene and Marty comes over to me, he goes, hey, man, he said, you know, you're supposed to get killed in this scene, and now you don't die. He said, what are we going to do? And I said, Let's have him knock me out. And he goes, oh, great idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That's how it works. Oh, man, this has been incredible. I loved it. I loved it. And uh, I thank you both for joining me today. I don't want to keep you too long, but, man, Thanks, it's Jess. just an incredible show. And hopefully you guys can come back and – we're going to build this platform up and we're going to make it bigger and bigger and get more fans on and to Great. come and be a you're part doing, of it. You're doing a good job. Gus. Yeah. No, job. thank you. Thank you. I'm just sitting here. It's nice. I get to sit in my house and do it. Oh, wow. Cool. Matthew Any, has to go into work. Anytime uh, John Ashton is on a show from now on, I won't be there. So yeah. You guys, <laughs> you guys have fun. John said he won't either after he sees that. Uh, you That's the good, sir. You'll be doing the show yourself, Gus. Okay. <laughs> I can handle that. I can handle that. I can handle that. Well, I appreciate you guys joining me on Huddle Up with Gus. It's been amazing. Um, hey, we, we got any more well, questions? I, didn't, I never you? asked you who's your who's your football team? Who's who my football team? Yeah, the, Giants. the Giants. The Giants. I'm from well, Connecticut. Yeah, all right. I'm a, I'm a, I figured. I, I mean, it I'm could a, be either way. I'm a, a Yankee fan and a Giants fan. Just like me. Yes, just like, like, just like me. I played, in a, I played in a, a golf tournament yesterday, an NFL alumni tournament. It was all Giants. So it's Harry Carson, uh, Howard Cross. Well, you know, well, the it, good there. Giants. Yeah, the good Giants. Yeah, yeah the good Giants. Okay, those yeah. Giants. Those yeah. Giants. Yeah. I was the only. I was the only Washington guy there, so I felt a little out of place when they called my name. I thought I was going to get hit by somebody. Well, Strahan wasn't there, so you were. No, yeah, he, yeah, okay. that's a, that's right. the worst hit I ever took. But well, I was just I was just back in Long Island about two weeks ago for Joe Namath's tournament. So. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah the great it, tournament. At Beth yeah, Page, right? we. Uh, well, no, this was at Glen Oaks. They didn't play okay. Beth Page. This year it was, they had it at Glen Oaks, and I told them. I told him, I said, look, before I come to the tournament, I just want to let you know I'm a Giants fan, <laughs> not a Jets fan. And yeah. then we, la we laughed about it. Everything was good. And I, I sat and had dinner with Joe, and it was great. It, it was Is he time. amazing or what? I interviewed him maybe a month ago, and he was just – I mean, yeah. he's from Pittsburgh, and he's one of my idols growing up. And you know about Joe, yeah. Pittsburgh kid, goes to Alabama. But just to interview him and sit here and talk to him about everything, like I'm talking with you guys, was amazing to me. I was, yeah. I was fanboying. Well, you know, he came up to me as soon as he, uh, you know, the first time we met there and he, he walked over to me and he gave me a big hug and he says, man, you've done a lot of good stuff, man. 
And I said, well, thanks, Joe. Thanks, who <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever worn pantyhose, John? Huh? Have you ever what? worn pantyhose? Joe might have mm. one up on you. Uh, I, don't not think that, you know. I, I wouldn't admit it if I did. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> All your buddies from high school don't ever want to hear you say that you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, guys. I appreciate you. Uh, have a good night. What do you guys have for dinner? Uh, pizza, probably. It's what I have every night. <laughs> I'm tortelloni tonight. So, what about you, right. John? I think I'm going to cook a little pasta with some meat sauce tonight. Yeah, myself. I'm going to cook a little pasta. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Yeah. Up with All right, us. thanks. We, Bye, we guys. Bye. Bye. Matthew, I'll Bye, talk guys. to you later. Thank okay. you, Gus. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining me uh, for Huddle Up with Gus. We'll see you next week. Uh, I think Mario Andretti's coming on next week, so it's going to be a great show. Thank you, Sounder FM. Thank you to Super Events. And uh, thank you to everyone who helps me out with this. I appreciate you, and we'll see you next week. And that's a wrap, sports fan. Thanks for joining in the fun at the 1631 Digital Studios for another action pack Huddle Up with Gus, featuring 15-year NFL quarterback Gus Verrott. Huddle Up with Gus is proudly produced by 1631 Digital Media and is available on Apple Music.